Okay, thank you all for coming. Um, so today I'm hoping to walk you through what genetics can tell us about substance use disorders. Um, now, you've all been here for at least a couple of weeks, I think, and um, working with Hank, you've probably started to get a good sense of a lot of this already. Um, so I'm hoping this will be a sort of step back, high level point of view, um, to give you a refresher on some of the stuff that you've already heard about, um, and as a you know sort of opportunity to ask some questions. So the objectives for today, I'm just going to move my little picture out of the way. Okay, um, are to gain a basic understanding of the genetic contribution to substance use disorders. So hopefully you already all know that genetics contribute to substance use disorders, but um, today I'll give you a little more detail about that. Um, we will um, hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to explain simply what a genome wide association study or a GWAS is, and what a polygenic risk score or a PRS is. And finally, um, hopefully you'll be able to understand how genetic research may in the future be integrated into clinical models to improve diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment of substance use disorders, right? This is the ultimate goal of the research um, that I do, but as you will see, it's not at that stage yet. So I thought I'd begin with a brief history of genetics. Now, how many of you have done some sort of like genetics course or done it as part of biology? Like, most okay all right so this should be like second nature to you um so the the heritable nature of traits has been known for hundreds of years right in fact it was back in 1865 when mendel discovered the basic laws of inheritance and as you probably all know these are two laws the first law is that each trait um each individual has a pair of um, alleles for a trait and each parent randomly passes one of those alleles onto the child. So that the child then inherits an allele from each parent for that trait. And the second law is that there are different genes for different traits. And generally, these laws have held true even today. Um, but it wasn't until almost 100 years later that Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA, actually providing the mechanism for how this inheritance works at the molecular level. 20 or so years later, um, we had the first uh, sequence of DNA. And in 2003, um, we had the Human Genome Project that provided the first full human genome sequence. And so these advances over hundreds of years have allowed the identification of many Mendelian traits and single gene disorders. And what I mean by that is where a single change at a particular site means that that person has that disorder. But what about the heritability of more complex traits such as substance use and psychiatric disorders, right? Ones where there's not just a single genetic change that causes the disorder. Well, so there's been a number of ways that people have tried to look at this over the years to identify genetic variants associated with these things. Um, one of them is linkage studies. So this was a fairly low resolution, um, just looking at sort of chunks of the DNA to see if um, particular chunks were passed down in individuals who had the phenotype compared to individuals who didn't. They then started to look at cancer gene studies. So they'd select um, genes based on what's known about the biology, and they'd see if those were associated. They looked at just single variants um, with sort of small numbers of cases and controls. Um, for a while, we were really like big into endophenotypes. Like when I was doing my PhD, this was kind of a big thing. It was the idea that instead of looking at the actual case status of someone, you'd look at like a feature of that um, status. So instead, for instance, of looking at people with cardiovascular disease, you might look at like something like um, um, HDL, cholesterol, something that may have been closer to the biology. Um, we've tried to look at gene environment interactions. But overall, a small number of associations have been found and variants have not been consistently replicated. 
Okay, so why is this? Um, this is a figure that is um, very, very popular for the geneticists to use. So if you've ever seen a genetics talk, you'll probably see this figure. Um, but the reason that this is, is because up here, we have those rare alleles that are causing Mendelian disease, right? And these are the ones that have been identified over years. And the thing is, they are very, very rare, and they have really high effect sizes on the phenotypes. But when we come to more complex disorders, such as substance use, what we're often looking for are actually these variants that are very, very common. So lots of people have them, but they have really small effects on the phenotype. So even though, and in fact, because they're more common, they have to have small effects, right? If they had large effects, then they may be selected against, and then um, they would become much rarer. Um, and so it is difficult to find variants with very small effect sizes. Furthermore, we know that it's not just genetic variants alone that cause a phenotype. Um, there is no sort of deterministic nature to complex disorders, unlike Mendelian diseases, where if you have the variant, you have the phenotype. For complex disorders, it is often an interaction between common variants, multiple of them with very small effects, interacting with environmental factors that can then cause the phenotype or the disorder. And so in order for us to identify genetic variants that are associated with a phenotype, um, we now use this term genome-wide association studies or GWAS. The first genome-wide association study actually happened relatively recently in 2005. Um, so that followed on um, from the first whole genome sequence. And the idea of it is that you have a set of cases for your phenotype and a set of controls. And you basically ask across the entire genome, um, is this variant more or less common in cases compared to controls? So this allows us to measure multiple variants and it tests each variant that we've measured against the phenotype in a hypothesis-free fashion. Now, any two individuals chosen randomly from the population actually only differ in about 0.5% of their genetic makeup. And only about 0.1% of that is single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are these single base pair changes. So that's, you know, at any location, one individual might have an A and the other individual will have a C. And single nucleotide polymorphisms are what we normally study when we are looking at uh, GWAS. So the thing to keep in mind is that GWAS is an association study that just aims to capture as much common SNP variation across the genome as possible, even though between any two individuals, there's only going to be about 0.1% of alleles that differ. What about all the 0.4%? Um, that is a structural variation. So copy number variants is when people have um, a small or sometimes quite large chunks of DNA that have been either deleted or duplicated. And we look at those in separate studies, but they have to be analyzed in a different way. And often um, copy number variants, um, we end up in that same sort of, they're rarer space and they, and they tend to have larger effect sizes. And so we don't look at those in, in GWAS. Um, Okay, so we test each available SNP, and this can be 100,000 to millions of SNPs. Uh, some of the recent studies we've been doing have been looking at like 20 million SNPs. And if we see an association between the phenotype and any particular SNP, it can mean a couple of things. The first is that it could mean that that SNP causes a change in the genome that directly influences the phenotype. Um, so for instance, it could lay in a gene um, like there's one with alcohol that commonly comes up that is in ADH1B, which is an alcohol dehydrogenase. And the SNP actually changes the protein that that gene produces and makes it um, uh, less able to break down alcohol. Um, the other potential uh, meaning, and this is actually much more common, is that the SNP is in linkage disequilibrium with the true causal SNP. And what do I mean by that? Well, 
Um, SNPs that are nearby to each other tends to be inherited together just from their position on the genome. Um, when you inherit um, sections of DNA from your parents, um, it's it's not like you're sort of inheriting all oh, this little section, this little section, this little, you're, you're inheriting chunks that are passed down. And over a population level, those chunks that get passed down tends to be the same sort of regions. And this means that if, um, let's say, this SNP here is actually the causal SNP, the one that's actually making the phenotype, um, it's inherited with all of these other SNPs that are red. And so if we've only tested this SNP over here in our GWAS, we'll see an association with this SNP, but it might actually be this SNP that is the causal one. Does that make sense or should I? How do we figure out which one it is? Which one is the causal one? Yeah. Um, that is an excellent question and is the um, result of many, many years of work, basically. There's multiple different ways. Um, some are sort of bioinformatic, you know, using computational techniques, um, and uh, some are actually um, using sort of wet lab techniques. But for many of the um, GWAS variants that we've identified, um, we actually still don't know what the causal variants are. Um, coming back to what I said about how common the variants are and how small the effect sizes are, this means that we need really, really large sample sizes, right? Because if a variant is only slightly more common in cases compared to controls, we need a lot of people to be able to pick up that effect size. And so here you can see an example of how many GWAS hits. So this is how many SNPs have been identified that are associated with the phenotype and what the sample size of the GWAS is. And you can see that as we increase, generally as we increase the sample size for GWAS, um, we get more and more variants found for association. Um, and for height, you can see this is 200,000. Um, I can tell you there's been a recent paper released that looked at um, tobacco use and um, alcohol consumption, and they had 3.5 million individuals. So we're getting up to very large sample sizes and very large um, uh, computational capacity needed to um, investigate these because if you've got 3.5 million individuals, 20 million SNPs that you're looking at, you can imagine a giant sort of matrix, right? 20 million by 3.5 million. Um, it's, um, it, it takes a little bit of time computationally. So another development uh, that's happened recently is that these large consortia have been formed, right? We need these really, really large samples. And so um, there's been consortia such as the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium that have pulled together samples from smaller studies in order to gain um, a greater sort of case and control sample size. And these have yielded a greater number of significant results. So for instance, um, I'm showing you two, uh, what are called Manhattan plots here. You may have seen these before, um, but essentially on the X axis, we have the various chromosomes starting at chromosome one, going to chromosome 22, and each dot is a SNP. And on the y-axis, we have the log 10 p-value. So this is the p-value of the association of that SNP with the phenotype. Higher up means more significant. Um, on the left here, this one is for schizophrenia back in 2014 or so, I think. And you've got only a few SNPs that are actually um, getting above the multiple testing correction line. But more recently, with much larger sample sizes, we now have all of these SNPs in green that are associated with schizophrenia. So these are both for that same phenotype, but on the right here is much larger sample sizes. One thing I do want to mention is that the population that we use for GWAS matters, and that currently, um, we have not been doing very well at this. Um, here we have the um, ancestry of the entire world, but here we have the GWASs that have been run so far for schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and major depression. And you can see that they are in majority European 
ancestry samples. And this becomes a problem when we are translating findings into clinical studies, which I'll show you a bit later. So another way to get these really large sample sizes and also to improve the um, ancestral representation of the individuals that are involved in these studies is to use biobanks and electronic health records. And this is a lot of the work that I do today. Um, these biobanks can contain hundreds of thousands of samples. So the Penn Medicine Biobank has about 45,000 people with genetic data, although it's got over 200,000 people that have been recruited. The Million Veteran Program, um, which is um, the VA, has about 650,000 people with genetic data, but almost a million have been recruited. They um, are much more multi-ancestry generally than the traditional GWAS collection samples. Um, and they're also good because they have longitudinal multi-phenotype data because they're linked to an individual's health record. So this is sort of like any time you go to the doctor, the information that you give them, that is all um, then linked to the data in these biobanks. Um, this means that we can actually develop quite high quality phenotypes for research. Um, so we can base our phenotypes on diagnosis codes. So this could be if you actually get a diagnosis when you're at the doctor, um, but also information on medications, on vital signs, you know, blood pressure, for instance, um, lab measurements, so cholesterol, that sort of stuff, um, whether or not individuals have procedures and even um, extracting information from the clinical notes. And we can use all of these to define cases and controls for genetic studies. Um, another great thing is that data is collected across the clinical phenome. So what I mean by that is that normally in the GWAS studies that we've had to date, um, the individuals collected because they are a case, say for alcohol use disorder, um, and then we have individuals that are controls, but we don't know anything else about them. Here, what we have is a set of individuals where we know multiple phenotypes that they have. So it's a really holistic view. And the nice thing about that is it allows us to put substance use disorders and psychiatric disorders in the same realm as um, other medical disorders, whereas traditionally those things have been kept separate. I'm just gonna check time here. All right, does anyone have any questions so far? Yeah. With um, a slide a few back that you talked about the um, the SNF for schizophrenia, um, does it make it more complicated once you find more SNFs associated with with the disease? Um. Yes. In in some ways, yes. Um. It it makes the biology more complicated, right? Because it's not it's not just the old oh yeah this this gene. And, and therefore the biology is sort of simple. No, when we find more and more SNPs, we're learning that really there can be all of these different changes that's hitting lots of different biological pathways. Um, and it's very likely that each individual with schizophrenia has a different combination of those SNPs that are in different biological pathways that are then uniquely affected by the particular environments that they've been put in. And that's what we're seeing more and more. Um, but finding more variants does give us more power for some of these other studies that I'll show you now. So it's, uh, it's good and bad. All right, so in order to illustrate all the sort of background that I've given you, um, I'm gonna show you uh, some of the work that we've been doing here. And the two ways that I want you to think about it is um, that we can take either a phenotype first approach, which means that we will start with a disease of interest. Um, we will create the phenotype, um, we will run the genetic analysis, and then we will do biological follow-up at the end. Or we take a genotype first approach, which actually means that we'll start with a gene of interest or a polygenic risk score, which I'll describe in a minute. And then we'll look to see if that's associated various phenotypes in a phenome-wide association analysis or a FIWAS. And then again, we can do biological follow-up. 
So this is a um, pictorial illustration of both the genotype first approach and the phenotype first approach. So um, in the phenotype first approach, that's essentially our GWAS, right? We define the phenotype first. We have our cases and our controls, and we look across the genome in a GWAS study to um, see if variants are, um, are more common in cases compared to controls or less. In a genotype first approach, we start with a with the genome, right? With the a genetic variant, and we look across the phenome at all the different phenotypes that individuals have to see if that is associated with um, any particular phenotype. Okay, so to illustrate the phenotype first approach, I'm going to show you how um, we've identified genetic variants for substance use disorders. And um, the one I'm focusing on is opioid use disorder. So as I'm sure many of you know, opioid use disorders are problematic pattern of opioid use. Um, 3.7% of US adults have reported past year opioid misuse and um, just over half a percent met criteria for opioid use disorder. An opioid use disorder is very serious because each year about 50,000 people die from opioid involved overdoses. Um, studies have shown, um, in fact, twin and family-based studies have shown that opioid use disorder is heritable with about a 50% heritability. But despite this, we haven't had much luck identifying actual genetic associations that demonstrate how that heritability is passed down. And prior to the study that I'm gonna show you, the largest opioid use disorder study, um, which contained about 20,000 cases, only identified two genetic variants that were associated with opioid use disorder. So we used the Million Veteran Program, one of those biobanks linked to electronic health records, in order to define cases and controls for opioid use disorder, our cases were based on um, just having one ICD-9 or ICD-10 code for opioid abuse or dependence. And our controls um, were all considered exposed to opioids. So this means that they had at some point been prescribed an opioid prescription, um, but they did not have um, opioid use disorder. So um, we included uh, African ancestry, European ancestry, and Hispanic ancestry individuals. Um, and in total, we had over 30,000 cases and almost 400,000 controls. Why was it necessary to have the controls people who have been like, given opioids before? Um, it wasn't necessary. There's been other studies that have um, used unscreened controls. Um, but one of the um, issues that we have for substance use disorders is that environment, right? If, if someone has not been exposed to an opioid, then they may actually have a really high genetic risk for developing opioid use disorder. But because they've never been given the opioids, they don't have opioid use disorder. And so by allowing our uh, controls to be exposed to opioids, we're, we're um, sort of eliminating that to some extent, right? Our controls have been exposed to opioids and yet they do not have opioid use disorder. Makes sense. Okay, so when we ran our GWAS, um, this doesn't look quite as impressive as that schizophrenia Manhattan plot, right? But if you compare it to the fact that we previously had two genetic variants, we were really kind of excited to find 14. <laughs> um, you know, for us, this was like, well, this is, this is a lot more. Um, we found the two that other people had found, so OPRM1 up here and furin, um, but we also found uh, many other um, genetic variants associated with OUD. So, okay, you think, right, this is this is great. We've we've identified some new genetic variants. Um, we can now sort of go ahead and look specifically at what each of these um, variants might do. What is the actual causal variant for each of these? Um, and we do have ongoing work to, to do that. But the other thing that we can do with GWAS is, is we can do various bioinformatic downstream analyses to tell us more about the disorder. And so that's what we did for this. Um, we did some analysis that showed that um, variants associated with opioid use disorder um, tended to be um, enriched in um, the central nervous system, 
Um, we found that they tended to be expressed in brain regions that had previously been associated with addiction. And so this kind of really allowed us to state in this paper that opioid use disorder really is a brain disease. Um, you know, it has a biological basis. Don't know why that looks funny there, but um, uh, the other thing that we could do is we could look at the genetic correlation of opioid use disorder with other traits. Um, and this allows us to say whether or not two traits are genetically similar. And so when we did this for opioid use disorder, um, we found that it was genetically correlated with many other substance use traits, which um, makes sense. Um, it was also genetically correlated with um, many psychiatric traits um, and um, negatively correlated with educational attainments. Okay, any questions about the opioid use disorder GWAS? Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to the genotype first approach. Um, and so this is where we're trying to uncover the phenotypic architecture that's associated with genetic liability for disorders. So this is now starting with the genome and going to the phenotype. Um, and so this is where polygenic risk scores come in. Now, I think actually probably all of you now have a sense of what polygenic risk scores are, because I think a lot of the projects that you've been working on have been using these. Um, but just, just sort of explain it from the ground up. The reason that we're using polygenic risk scores is because each of these SNPs that we identify that are associated with the phenotype, as I said, they have a really, really small effect. And so what polygenic risk scores allow us to do is for each individual, we can aggregate the effect of all of the SNPs that they have that give them risk for disorder into a single score that allows us to um, predict their genetic liability for that disorder. Now, in polygenic risk score, we actually use all of the SNPs that we get from a GWAS, not just the ones that are passing that um, multiple testing correction threshold. Now, why do we do that? Well, not all of the heritability of the disorder is explained by the significant SNPs. And SNPs that are non-significant could contain real signal. Um, they might not be significant because of those really, really small effect sizes and because we've applied a stringent multiple testing correction. We, as you saw in that, um, the two Manhattan plots I showed for schizophrenia earlier, when we had a smaller sample size, we had fewer SNPs. We got a larger sample size, we got more SNPs. So theoretically, we expect that many of the SNPs below the line may also become significantly associated with the phenotype if we had large enough sample sizes to test them. Um, so that's why we use all of the SNPs. But also, what if we want to predict the phenotype in a new sample, which would allow us to identify individuals at high risk for disorders that could benefit from targeted interventions, test the contribution of genetic risk for disorders to patterns of comorbidity, you know, why people have multiple disorders. That's then a good reason to calculate polygenic risk scores. All right, so what is a polygenic risk score? This is the simplest um, explanation you will get <laughs> of what a polygenic risk score is. We start with our GWAS. So we run a GWAS, um, let's say for opioid use disorder. Um, and the output of a GWAS is essentially for every SNP that we've measured, we have an effect size and we have a p-value for how significantly associated it is. And so that's what I'm showing on the left here. So this is just the effect size of the SNP A at this location. Then the effect size of G at this location, the effect size of C at this location, and so on. We then go to our new samples. So these are people that were not included in the original GWAS. And for each person, we ask, do they have this SNP? And you can see that this person, for instance, has this SNP twice, right? Because each person has a pair of alleles. So they have two times the effect size. Do they have this SNP? Yep, they have one. So they have one times the effect size. And you can note that here, the effect size is negative which means that it actually decreases risk for the disorder. And we keep doing this over and over, adding them all up. 
until we get an overall risk score of 0 0.04 for this individual. We do the same thing for the next individual and they get 0 0.01. So we can say that this person has a higher polygenic risk score and therefore a higher genetic risk for the disorder compared to this individual. Um, one thing to note is that these actual numbers are arbitrary. Um, what I mean by that is that they are, as you can see, based on which SNPs we've actually put in. And we are not capturing every single SNP that the person has. And we're also not capturing every single SNP that could potentially contribute to opioid use disorder. All we've got is what we measured in the GWAS, which is not every SNP in the genome, and what we're measuring in the individual. So if I then went and used a different GWAS for opioid use disorder, it is possible that this person would then have a slightly different number for their polygenic risk score. Um, and because the number is arbitrary, it also means that if this person had a negative score, it wouldn't mean that they have a reduced risk for the disorder. Um, when you calculate these, um, all you can do really is compare one individual to another or one individual to a population. Um, all right, before I move on to methods for that, is um, any questions? Yeah. To determine the genes that you use based on the, the line that's on the chart? Um, the multiple testing correction line? Yeah. No, we use every SNP that we've tested, even if the SNPs are non-significant. Which, how do you decide which SNPs to test in the GWAS? Um, it is dependent on a number of factors, uh, some which are technical. Um, so literally just the, the chips that we're using to capture the data, which SNPs do they have on it. Um, but mostly we test SNPs that are common enough for us to actually see variation, right? Like if, if there's only one person in a million that has a change at that location, there's no point us looking for it. Um, so we normally look at SNPs that have at least 1% um, or at least 5% of the population have, have variation. Um, and then we also um, perform quality control measures. Um, so, you know, sometimes um, the, the SNPs um, aren't tested in everybody. So we'll throw, you know, we'll throw that set out um, if there's a high level of missingness or that sort of thing. So it can vary quite significantly across GWASs. All right, this sort of gets at your question about the um about that line, right? So um, there is one method that actually um, uh, selects SNPs at certain levels above the line and below the line, and so on. Um, and the reason that we the reason that we do this, right, is because I was explaining this to you quite simply, right? We've just got all the SNPs. We we times them by whether or not the person has them, and we add up their effect sizes. But of course, there's that tricky thing of, of linkage disequilibrium, right? Where we know that SNPs are passed down together. And what we don't want is um, for a particular region to have a higher weighting in our polygenic risk score, just because it happens that a bunch of SNPs have been passed down together and they're inherited together, and therefore they're all significant. And so we have various methods to account for linkage disequilibrium. One is um, basically within each um, within each chunk of the genome, we just select the top SNP that's um, associated, even if that SNP is not significantly associated. Um, we can look at various cutoffs, um, or we can perform some sort of more complicated um, beta shrinkage, which um, increases the effect size of that, the most significant SNP in a region and decreases the effect sizes of the other SNPs in the region. Um, I'd be happy to run through these in more detail kind of after this session, if anyone is interested. Um, okay, so as I was saying, um, what we can do with these polygenic risk scores is we can compare um, individuals, um, but Really, we, what we can't do is use them to say this individual has this disorder. Um, often um, you'll see that individuals that have the lowest risk tend to be much less likely to have the disorder and individuals in the very top 
areas of risk tend to be much more likely to have the disorder. But if we had an individual with a polygenic risk score here, as you can see, we couldn't tell if this individual would be in the healthy group or the group with the disorder. And that issue I brought up earlier about um, the GWAS being conducted mostly in European ancestry to date, um, that becomes a problem for our polygenic risk scores. Um, polygenic risk scores that are calculated from European GWAS, but then we use them to count um, in uh, non-European individuals, do not perform as well. They do not associate with the phenotype as well. And the reason for that is because there are differences in LD patterns um, between different um, genetic ancestries. The ideal scenario um, to improve this would be to actually increase the number of non-European ancestry individuals in GWASs. Um, and this is work that is ongoing, um, especially in the last couple of years, people have realized that this is very important to do. Um, but we still, what we're tending to find is that as we increase the non-European ancestries, we're also increasing the European ancestries. So there's still this consistent disparity. Um, the current scenario is to use methods that improve the portability of GWAS across ancestries. There's a number of bioinformatic methods that can try and get around this, but they're not perfect. Um, Okay, so I'm going to illustrate a couple of uh, polygenic risk score studies um, that we've uh, run, uh, some of which you may have even read in your um, various papers that you've been given, um, and then we'll sort of open up for the discussion. Right? Um, so this was a study that we ran in the Penn Medicine Biobank, another of those um, biobanks linked to electronic health records. We wanted to calculate polygenic risk scores for substance use disorders um, in the individuals in the Penn Medicine Biobank. And we wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, are the polygenic risk scores associated with the disorder that we expect them to be, right? So is the tobacco use disorder polygenic risk score associated with tobacco use? Um, and then what else are they associated with in a phenome-wide association analysis if you look across the entire phenome? So we used our various um, MVP GWASs uh, for tobacco, alcohol, and opioids. Um, and um, we uh, calculated the polygenic risk scores using that beta shrinkage method. Um, I do want you to note that the sample size uh, for the GWAS in um, African ancestry is smaller than the European ancestry, as you can see here. And this does mean that the polygenic risk score has a reduced power to identify associations. Um, and these were our sort of primary results. So this is us testing the polygenic risk score for each um, phenotype against the primary phenotype. So here I'm showing you the one for alcohol use disorder, opioid use disorder, and tobacco use disorder. Um, the polygenic risk score is on the x-axis and it is divided into quintiles. So one is the lowest genetic risk and five is the highest genetic risk. And then on the y-axis, we have the case prevalence. So this is actually how many individuals have that phenotype in the Penn Medicine Biobank within that particular um, quintile of genetic risk. Um, and so if we take tobacco use disorder as an example, because this is the um, one that is the most impressive, um, we can see that in the lowest quintile of risk, about 30% of individuals have tobacco use disorder. So in genetic liability for tobacco use, 30% um, still have tobacco use disorder. But in the top quintile of tobacco use, um, this increases to about 35% in Africans and 45% of people with tobacco use in Europeans. So the polygenic risk score is clearly picking up on something. As we increase genetic risk, we are increasing the case prevalence of the disorder. But still, if you had any single individual um, and you said, oh, this person's in the lowest quintile of risk, mm, there's still a good chance they might have tobacco use disorder. Okay. And so that's important to understand. These are very useful at a population level for looking at associations. But at an individual level, 
they're not going to be deterministic for whether or not that person has the disorder. So as I said, we then performed a phenome-wide association study. And so that's the results that I'm showing you here. Um, now, this is actually very like a Manhattan plot, except instead of each point being a SNP, this time each point is a phenotype. And they are grouped by their type. Um, so for instance, everything here is the circulatory system. Um, and again, as we go further up, um, we have more of a significant effect. Um, on the top, we have the African ancestry individuals, and on the bottom, we have the European ancestry individuals. So what I'm showing here is, does the polygenic risk score for smoking associate with other phenotypes? Um, as I showed you on the previous slide, it obviously associates with tobacco use disorder in both um, the African and the European sample. Um, but it also associates with additional phenotypes. So it associates with alcohol-related disorders, um, emphysema, which you can imagine if um, an individual has tobacco use disorder, they'd be more likely to have emphysema. And in the European sample, we see a lot more associations. And this is because that polygenic risk score is more accurate because it was based on a larger GWAS sample. And so we're picking up lots of different things. We're seeing that a, if you have higher genetic liability for smoking, you are also likely to have um, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, um, alcoholism, lung cancer, et cetera. OK, any questions about that? All right, so I added these in, um, these few slides in, because this is the data set that a lot of you have been working on. This is the LPEM data set, right? And that sounds familiar to everybody, I'm sure. Um, so one of the biobanks and electronic health records are great, but because they allow us to get these really, really large sample sizes, um, we've got this multi-phenotype data, it's multi-ancestry, all these things are good. But the issue with them is that um, they are not accurately, or they're not consistently accurately phenotyped. And what I mean by that is that we're relying on someone having gone to the doctor for that particular thing and getting that diagnosis in their records. Now, for instance, I get um, allergies in, in the spring, right? Like hay fever and stuff. I don't think that that's actually recorded in my health record necessarily because I don't bother to go to the doctor for it, right? I just take the over-the-counter stuff. Um, and so there is missing data, right? We don't know for certain, we, you know, it's not like every individual has been evaluated for that same set of phenotypes. Um, and it also relies on the doctor actually sort of putting that diagnosis in the record. Um, so in order to kind of supplement this, um, we wanted to use the Yale Penn sample where everybody has had that extensive interview that is um, deeply phenotyped. All of the individuals have been asked the same set of questions. Um, and so what we did is we decided to take those 4,000 data points that they were asked and we reduced them uh, to about 700 that we could use for FIWAS analyses. Um, this was through a sort of iterative process um, where we selected phenotypes that we thought would be informative for genetic analysis that weren't repetitive um, across the phenotypes. Um, this uh, just sort of shows you the, the phenotypic data. So for um, African and European individuals, um, you can see that there is a large overlap of the various substance use disorders. Um, so many people who have one substance use disorder also have another substance use disorder. Um, but then we did the same thing, right? We created polygenic risk scores for the various um, uh, substance use disorders. And we asked, are they associated with the expected substance use disorders? So um, here we created polygenic risk scores for alcohol use disorder, opioid smoking, and cannabis use disorder. And we saw that for alcohol use disorder, um, the polygenic risk scores are associated with alcohol dependence and alcohol use disorder in both the African and European samples. 
For opioid use disorder, we saw an association only in the European samples. Again, this is likely due to that polygenic risk score not performing well in the African samples, not because this is actually a null finding. Um, tobacco use disorder, again, in the European sample only, and cannabis um, in the European sample because we do not have a GWAS for cannabis use disorder in African ancestry samples that we could use. We then also ran a FIWAS analysis. So again, we're looking across the phenotypic spectrum. Um, and here I'm showing you the ones for alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorder on the left in Africans and in the right in Europeans. And so we're saying if someone has a higher genetic risk for alcohol use disorder, what else, um, what other phenotypes is that associated with? And you can see it's associated with um, things like years of education. It's associated with whether they've ever used opiates, with um, tobacco dependence. Um, and then also some symptoms of various things. So, for instance, if they've ever sought treatment for panic disorder. Um, Opioid use disorder, very similar, and also um, genetic liability for opioid use disorder has associations with other um, substance use disorders, um, with other uh, symptoms of psychiatric disorders, um, and even this one's for you, Jackson, um, for uh, the criterion gambling for an unsuccessful effort to decrease gambling um, association. Okay, so I wanted to end with a couple of kind of summary slides. Um, so to start with, um, we have implications for clinical practice. And so this is coming back to what I was saying earlier. I want to be very clear that currently these polygenic risk scores are not predictive of disorder in an individual. Um, there's actually kind of like, that. there's a couple of main issues with this. One is that they have limited power, right? We're running these GWASs in very large samples, but we're still not managing to estimate the exact effect size of every single variant, right? There's still sort of standard errors around each of those. And as we get these larger and larger GWASs, we will manage to increase the accuracy of the effect size of each of those variants. Um, as you saw, we also have issues with ancestry. They're not transferable across ancestries and the non-European GWASs are much smaller, which means that the polygenic risk scores created from those have a um, weaker power to identify associations. I do expect in the future with larger and larger GWASs, these polygenic risk scores will become more predictive. But even then, they're not going to be deterministic because remember, we're going to have someone's genetic liability but there is also the environment, again, with the opioid use. You know, they might have a very high genetic liability for opioid use disorder, but if they're not exposed to an opioid, they're not going to get opioid use disorder. They need to have both. Or maybe they have a high genetic risk for depression, but if they're not exposed to any particular stresses or something, maybe they don't develop depression. So there's always going to be an interaction between that genetic liability and the environment. We and others are performing research to identify whether these polygenic risk scores will actually be useful to stratify individuals into treatment programs. Um, so for so even though these may not be predictive, they may still be of use in clinical prediction, right? They may it may be that someone with um, a higher genetic liability for disorder, maybe that person will respond better to a particular treatment compared to someone with a lower genetic liability. They may, of course, also help guide um, prevention efforts, right? If someone has a high genetic liability, um, maybe we sort of advise them on how to manage their environment so that they have a reduced risk of the disorder. Um, and I just think it's important to understand the, the limitations and the usefulness of these polygenic risk scores, especially in the era of personalized genomics, right? Where like 23andMe, for instance, will tell you your genetic risk for a disorder. Um, keep in mind that this is not um, deterministic. Okay, so in summary, um, Psychiatric genetics research in the past two decades has shown that psychiatric disorders, including substance use disorders, 
have a biological component and that their genetic architecture is complex. It's made up of many, many genetic variants, small effect sizes. Each individual probably has a different combination of those small effect size variants. Um, we use genome-wide association studies to identify genetic variants that are associated with disorders. Biobanks linked to electronic health records um, have emerged as a resource to allow us to study the genetic architecture of these disorders. And as I've mentioned, they have lots of advantages, diverse ancestry, multi-phenotype, longitudinal data. We can then um, take these GWAS results and calculate polygenic risk scores and run phenome-wide association studies to identify whether genetic liability for one disorder is associated with risk for other disorders. But as I've mentioned, polygenic risk scores are not currently sufficiently predictive for use in clinical practice, but we do expect them to increase in their utility. And hopefully um, in the next decade, they'll be useful for diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. So I've got my thank you slide. You know many of these people on this list. 